Hi, I'm Jennifer Bugis. I'm from the University of South Florida uh, School of Music. I serve as an associate professor of music education there. And first, I, I would like to thank the, the Grammy Foundation for their generous support on the project. Um, our project examined the effects of an intense piano training program on cognitive and motor and psychosocial outcomes in patients with Parkinson's disease. And <clears throat> Most people um, know about that Parkinson's disease is a disease that often is characterized by motor symptoms, uh, such as tremors or, or rigidity, bradykinesia, and gait difficulties. Uh, but there are also a lot of non-motor symptoms um, that affect patients with Parkinson's. And, and one is a progressive decline in area of these executive functions. So um, one area that has, has shown to benefit patients with Parkinson's disease is, is piano training, or at least patient, healthy patients is, is uh, piano training. And so we tried to, we applied that to in a, in a paradigm to look at the effects of an intense piano training program um, on patients with Parkinson's disease in those three areas. So we recruited 45 patients who had a formal diagnosis in stage one or two of Parkinson's uh, across two sites, and along with my colleague, Teresa Lasuk at the University of Miami, and also at the University of South Florida in Tampa. And um, the criteria for those individuals included people who were between the ages of 50 to 80 with uh, less than five years of formal music training and that were not currently reading music or engaged in music um, so that it can be a novel stimulus for them. And we had a, a series of group intensive classes that focused on piano technique, finger dexterity, basic piano repertoire, music theory that were administered over a, an intense 10 day period uh, for three hours per day. So they received 30 hours of music training um, and no outside practice was required. And um, pre and post, we administered a battery of measures um, preliminary measures of music aptitude and, and intelligence, but also uh, dependent measures that included music achievement, um, cognitive measures, cognitive control, verbal fluency, um, and processing speed, and motor measures that included finger dexterity and gait, um, as well as psychosocial measures of general and, and musical self-efficacy. And um, so overall, we found that those enrolled in the piano training program demonstrated enhanced musical achievement, um, thus demonstrating transfer in the domain, which is really, really important to, to look at. Um, and in addition, we also found transfer across domains. So we found that our results show that, uh, that um, those that engaged in piano training as compared to our controls demonstrated enhanced inhibition or, or cognitive control uh, post training on a standardized troop task. Um, we also found that enhanced um, musical self-efficacy, which is important as well um, in terms of, of um, psychosocial outcomes. This suggests that piano training could, could be an effective intervention for those patients with Parkinson's disease. I'd also stress that many music training should include music outcomes um, because there seems to be a variability in the response to music education interventions related to quality and, and training implementation. So I think that that's one um, important element. It's also important to note that our findings are very similar in healthy related individuals. So, so piano training can be extended as an effective intervention for those with Parkinson's. Um, in addition, you know, I think that's, um, again, most people think of Parkinson's as a motor, um, most of the motor symptoms affiliated with Parkinson's, but I think there's also a need to address um, the cognitive outcomes as well. So. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth next. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Elizabeth Stegmuller. I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Kinesiology at Iowa State University and Director of um, the Neuroscience Graduate Program at Iowa State. I'm also um, a board certified uh, music therapist. So um, my research line really focuses on um, much like uh, Jennifer's in understanding um, how music can be effective for people with Parkinson's disease um, and the underlying mechanisms. So for this uh, study that was sponsored, um, and again, thank you so much for the support from uh, the Grammy Foundation and Museum. Um, we looked, uh, we wanted to know what the underlying mechanisms or potential underlying mechanisms may be for improvements that we have seen in our previous data with singing in Parkinson's disease. So we have shown that people with Parkinson's disease about after eight weeks of singing show improvements in respiratory control um, and swallow and some improvements in voice as well. Um, and so um, swallowing problems in people with Parkinson's disease are one of the leading causes of death in people with Parkinson's disease. So you have difficulty swallowing and then you must cough that material out. 
um, if it seeps into the lungs. And so it's important that even we focus on exercising these other muscles that may be impacted by Parkinson's disease. And singing seems to be a wonderful way to do that. Um, but what was missing is kind of, well, what is the underlying mechanism? We also had our participants from a qualitative study report that they felt less stress and a little bit more bonded. And so the study proposed to look at one session of singing and to uh, look at what are the acute effects of singing um, in those that have been singing for at least one year and those that have not been singing. And all, both groups had Parkinson's disease. And so in short, what we found is that um, our results are variable as we would have expected. Uh, but the most intriguing result is that some participants improved on their clinical motor symptoms um, at a level of 11 to 12 points, which uh, for their medication, the improvement is uh, a clinical meaningful um, improvement is a drop of four points. So we're seeing about three times the effect after one hour of singing. Um, and all of our participants were on their medication. So it's not like it was a, um, even a meds effect there. So um, that to us was phenomenal, but not every person showed that response. Um, and so now we're, we're digging through our uh, data. We've looked, um, we're looking at cortisol, oxytocin, and um, a whole slew of inflammatory cytokines as markers and to try to understand how those might be related. Are they changing? And again, we do see changes in cortisol and inflammatory markers and oxytocin uh, that are positive that happen after one hour of singing. But the question is, how do we put all of this together? Um, and we're really beginning to look more at the intervention design and trying to tease that out and say, is there something about the intervention that some people show improvements where others don't? Um, and then finally, we had um, a, a portion of the study was to look at the motor cortical activity that was um, associated with swallowing. And what we found in those that have been singing for at least a year, and this again is pilot, pilot data, um, we have found that those that have been singing for a year have more bilateral control of the muscles uh, used for swallow, which is important. Um, and rather than um, the participant that has not been singing, doesn't ever sing, has a unilateral um, control. Um, so Parkinson's disease typically starts on one side and then we'll move to both sides of the, um, of the body. So it's important uh, even in our interventions to look at uh, both sides and the control of both, both um, sides uh, muscle groups. And so we think it's um, pretty interesting that we see this uh, more bilateral control of swallow, which is good, may help that may be um, the underlying reason why we see improvements in swallow in people with Parkinson's disease, but um, we still need to finish data collections and analysis to make a final uh, determination. But um, that's in short, I hope, enough <laughs> to, about the research that we're doing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. All right. Um, I'd like to turn to Lisa um, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your, and your work. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, it's so great to meet everybody and to hear about your projects. And I wanted to thank the Grammy Library Foundation as well, sorry, <laughs> Grammy Museum Foundation um, for the funding that has been so pivotal for me with this project. The project is called Parenting Musically. And um, I'm the pro professor of music education at Case Western Reserve University. And the last 10 or 15 years, I've looked quite a bit at musical parenting. And there's quite a few studies looking at how families use music, going to music classes, taking lessons, having music in the home. But there hasn't been as much study of how families use music to accomplish other goals as parents or as caregivers. So using music to calm, using music um, during diaper changes, using music to develop self-efficacy. And so in this project, I wanted to really broaden our ideas about that. And I also wanted to broaden the voices that we were hearing from in a lot of the research I had done and that some of my colleagues had done, we tended to hear from people who were enrolled in early childhood music programs and that tended to be a certain demographic. Mm -hmm. So for this study, I was able to recruit eight families in the Cleveland area, which is where I live. And the families represented a range of diversities um, of every kind of diversity. And I worked with the families for a year and spent time with them um, at least once a month over the course of a year. So we went through an entire year of birthdays and holidays 
and milestones, uh, recitals, school programs, celebrations. And it was such a, an honor to learn from the families and to ask them about what was happening, happening musically for them. I was looking at music in the home and also at school and in the community. And through all of this developed a framework for understanding the kinds of interactions, um, thinking of both the musical parenting that I, that I started with, but also parenting musically. So using music in, for other parenting tasks. And then also considering how music can be used relationally as well as practically. And plotting all of that out a little bit, um, but it was qualitative, so it wasn't literal plotting. Um, and just seeing that within the families, there was such a range of experience and such a range of um, the repertoire that was beloved and the experiences that were sought um, and that there wasn't one right way to do the musical parenting. And that had been something that had been expressed to me. People, oh, I didn't play music while I was pregnant. Did I deprive my child? Oh, we haven't started music lessons. Is my child going to be okay? So part of the richness of my experience with these families was seeing that there's so many ways um, for this to unfold and so many expressions of a musical home um, that there's not just like, this is a musical home, but there's so many ways, so many ways to be musical. So um, check my notes here. The parents were doing more than they realized. That was one of the things that stood out to me. And um, one family said, well, I described the study and they said, well, I guess, you know, you could do that, but it's going to be a really short conversation. And then as we went through the year, more and more unfolded. Um, and they, they felt really good when they realized how much they were doing. Um, and also the importance of mutuality, especially in community settings, when families could go together and experience music at an outdoor concert or dancing at a wedding. There was something really special for them where the parent didn't have to organize it. They were more um, on the same level and were able to experience it together. And um, that was another one of the key findings. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's wonderful. And now we're going to move to Jenny and to Caitlin, um, who uh, worked on the same study. Um, and I think that this follows beautifully with what Lisa just said, which is why I've sort of organized it this way. So who, which of you would like, Caitlin, would you like to start? Sure, and we'll sort of tag team as we- Okay, tag team, but however you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Caitlin Fosby. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Oregon, and I direct the UO Learning Lab. Um, and so in this project, um, you know, we started from the observation that lots and lots of cool stuff happens in babies' brains over the first year of life. Um, lots about how they, process sounds and musical sounds. Um, so we kind of know what happens, but we're still puzzling through the details of exactly what sounds do they hear in real life that could drive all of these changes. And we didn't really know a whole lot about this because nobody had gone to listen to those everyday sounds. So in this project, we listened. Oh. Hi, I'm, I'm Jenny Mendoza. Um, I'm a research associate working with Caitlin, and I'm also a research analyst with the Oregon Early Learning Division at the State Department of Education. Um, so just to continue about our project, um, what we wanted was to capture all of the sounds that happened over the course in an, of an infant's day. Um, and it would be too long for a family to come into the lab and not very practical for us to be in their home all day long. Um, so lucky for us, there is a great recorder that we could use. Um, it's called Alina. It's a lightweight um, recorder that fits in a pocket on a vest that an infant wears, and it's easy for families to use on their own. So they were able to record up to 16 hours of their day. And then we listened to those recordings in the lab and found out when baby tunes were happening. Um, so what we ended up with was a timeline of when sounds happened in an infant's day and when music happened in an infant's day. Um, you can see that in the image that is in Dr. Fozzie's background there. Um, so each timeline is of one infant's day. The start of the day is at the top of the timeline and you progress through the day as you move down the column. Um, the purple sections are when music was happening. The yellow sections are other kinds of sounds like people talking or dishwashers running. And then the green sections are silence. Hmm. 
And so across all of the timelines, we discovered that about 9% of everyday seconds are music. And we also discovered that a lot of those musical sounds were combinations of what could be happening. So some were live and vocal music, so things like a caregiver singing, and then others were recorded and instrumental music, so maybe a crib mobile playing soft, sleepy music. Yeah, I'll continue with one other a really interesting aspect of the patterns that we uh, found about musical sounds in everyday life. So one of the coolest puzzles to try to figure out is how babies learn so much so fast. Um, and one of the sort of things that could help is if you don't know very much, if you hear something over and over and over again where you have a chance to make it easy to remember, that could be really good. But you don't want to get stuck just in that one thing. So having some other sounds, some diversity in voices, and a bunch of different tunes sort of sprinkled in occasionally could be good. And we found just that sort of mix um, in the daily patterns of music. So lots of repetition of one voice or one tune, but not just that sort of sprinkled in uh, occasionally other sounds. Um, and as a learning theorist, that's really interesting and exciting to me because we also are starting to understand that sort of pattern in the things that babies see, so what faces they see during their everyday life, or what objects they see, and the names that they hear about them. So sort of this suite of things that's like showing up no matter where we look in everyday life suggests that this might be really important for early learning. And so in this project now we have a sense that musical sounds are sort of obeying this maybe potentially quite general law about early learning. Okay. Anything else you want to say, Jenny or Caitlin, about your study? Good. All right. Well, thank you all of you for such fascinating work and such important work. Um, and it's it's so exciting to hear these in detail and hear from you um, uh, about them. So right now, I'd like to just ask uh, you in general, do you have questions for each other having listened to each other talk about your studies? Would anybody like to ask a question of someone else? Okay, um, then I have, I have some questions that I'd like to, um, to ask. And one of them goes back to Jennifer, you kind of brought up something that I think uh, I'd like to explore with you um, all as experts and music researchers and experts in music education, learning, therapy, healing, interventions, um, about the importance of music. Um, you know, like in other words, uh, music as enhancement, music in terms of our understanding of the brain, music in terms of our understanding of uh, what enhances development and developmental um, uh, 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 resilience, for example, uh, and different applications you can think of for your work and future ways you would think of transferring it. A lot, you know, Elizabeth, you were talking about um, singing, you know, I'm curious to know if cortisol goes down and psychosocial goes up, you know, with people who don't have Parkinson's, right? I mean, singing is so important in so many ways. Um, and Jennifer, you talked about transfer, right, quite a bit. And I think uh, the, the three of you with Lisa and Jenny and Caitlin, you know, there's so many implications of what you're talking about in terms of the innate musicality of mommies and babies and daddies and communities and people who don't, they say, oh, I'm not a musician because I'm not like in the, in the symphony, um, but they are musical and teachers are musical and people are musical and mommies and babies in utero. Would, and I'd be curious, Caitlin, about, you know, the nine months prior to birth <laughs> in terms of what's being heard um, from four months when the ear is online um, and linking that, that research to what you're talking about and begin to understand, especially linking it to facial expressions. But I'm just sort of like, now I'm pre-associating riffing a little bit, but the idea is for you to do that, um, to talk about implications and the importance of your research and different ways you can see this applying uh, to different areas creatively. So would anybody like to start? Jennifer, I'll start with you since we started before. 
Well, I, I agree that there are and there are lots of implications from from all of these research projects. I think the in terms of what what we found in, in our project, we found that um, certainly the music music training in terms of, of having opportunities for those that have not had music training before. I mean, these were individuals who enrolled in this in these studies and several of my previous studies with with health adults as well as this one with Parkinson's. Um, we, we often include individuals with with little to no prior music background. But however, you can continue to learn something new even if you've had a little bit of training or had training in the past in different ways, maybe picking up a new instrument or trying something, you know, that novelty is a really important element in a cognitive training program. Right. And um, music offers that at any range and any stage of learning. So I think that there's lots of um, implications in terms of the development of programs, not only for Parkinson's patients, but for, for others, um, particularly that involve active music participation and performance. And, and not just piano, but other Right, not just piano, yeah. other instruments. Yes, yeah. I think the, um, predominantly in the past, there's been a lot of, of research on music listening, and music listening certainly has many benefits. Right. But I think that um, extending it to active performance yeah. is really and that's a really important thing in music education as yes. well. Um, I had a, you know, I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts. The Stroop test, you know, is is connected with with executive function and flexibility and creative thinking. And that is also linked with dominant right hemisphere kind of uh, reaction to novelty. And, um, and those kinds of trainings are positive, especially for people um, that may uh, uh, have a negative reaction to novelty because of stress responses. And I'm wondering if you have anything to say about that. Well, I, although we didn't, did not measure cortisol in this study, as, as I know that Elizabeth is measuring that in her study, um, we have other, other data that suggests that there is a, a decrease in, in stress as one is, is um, playing the piano. And certainly there are other studies that suggest that as well. I mean, that would certainly be an interesting path to go down in the future with, um, with piano training. Um, but we did find that there was certainly a benefit in musical self-efficacy, which may contribute to future engagement in music programs and, and not just piano, but other types of programs. So um, for those that have never played an instrument, you know, the opportunity to even engage in a short term uh, training program can can lend itself to maybe lifelong participation in, in a music program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Elizabeth, do you want to say anything about transfer, application, expansion, um, from, from your research and your standpoint? Yeah, we've talked a lot about um, you know, thinking is something that every person can do. <laughs> and, and so I always get that uh, comment, well, I can't sing. And I'm like, well, I can't either, but come on, let's do it, you know, and we engage in music together. Um, but I think that there's, you know, applications in, in terms of the physical realm of it for, you know, potentially people who've had a stroke that are having difficulty with swallowing and respiratory control. But we've even um, discussed, you know, right now with our pandemic and um, the way that COVID affects the respiratory system, right. and the isolation and whatnot that, you know, even maybe just singing can help with our respiratory control in that realm, but also with the, there's the, I think the problem, it's not a problem, it's a wonderful problem to have about engaging in music research is that music affects so many different things. <laughs> so we can look at the physical, but we know that it has such a psychosocial impact that it's often hard to separate the two. Um, yeah. And because we know that it, it affects your immune system and, and everything. And so it's kind of, I think that just as a human species that engaging in music, whether you're good at it or not, or whether you have a disability or whether if you're just listening to it, whatever age you are, there's so many benefits of it that um, I think all of this research is yeah. very uh, translational in how it affects across the human lifespan. Yeah, you kind of, um anticipated one of my <laughs> one of my thoughts which was about respiratory issues and covid and um but the other piece is that you know singing involves breathing and deep breathing 
um, obviously, which is connected with um, self-regulation and emotional regulation. And back to relational with mommies and babies, uh, interactive, what we call in my work, interactive regulation with mommies and babies through vocalization and rhythmic entrainment, which involves breathing and moving from uh, sympathetic to parasympathetic also involves breathing in trauma work. And so, um, as you said, the correlations, you know, can start to boggle your mind when you start to see all the different areas. One of the things I think is so great about um, your research and how we look at the uh, applications in terms of the Grammy Foundation is the specificity of it because there's a lot of we can get lost in in saying well music is great for empathy and music is great for this and music is great for that and you know the old mozart effect problem um and and then and 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 without real data and without actual you know hard research whether qualitative or quantitative and then linking together and then thoughtfully expanding from data rather than having the global kind of feel good stuff uh, that often, um, you know, it, it doesn't do music justice and it doesn't do the science justice in my view. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I'm, I love this program so much and I love reading all these, you, you know, and, and it is mind boggling, but on the other hand, the specificity allows for more thoughtful expansion rather than the opposite. Yes, exactly. So, um, and I also think it's important to consider, I mean, I think everyone between the qualitative and the physical, you know, the, the qualitative study, just asking the participants what they thought really kind of opened my mind into that specificity. Like they're actually saying that they feel better, that there's this stress, you know, so, you know, with everything being connected, that helped me determine that specificity of what I wanted to look at next. And I think that especially in music research, uh, because it is such a big, vast <laughs> component right. that the, the participant experience is also um, very important to consider because it's going to, I think, open up a lot of avenues. Um, Lisa, do you want to say anything about where you see the implications of your work and where you see it going? And, you know, here's some interesting correlations here with you, you know, right here. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So um, I was able to write a book based on the data and it's uh, Parenting Musically. And before the COVID shutdown, I did several book talks for families. And as part of the Grammy Foundation support, I was able to buy materials for music kits for families. So I had a little mm. summary of some ideas and then shakers and um, picture books that featured musical themes that I was able to share with families. I still have a whole basement full of these uh, for when COVID is done to keep, to keep going um, with some library outreach and, and some of that programming. And I also am hoping to do some more translational work, um, taking the research and, and making some really hands-on practical ideas for families, um, even little cards in a box that they could pull out, like here's an idea for bath time, here's an idea for in the car, here's an idea for helping with schoolwork. And my latest idea is to start a podcast about parenting musically and to mm -hmm. have episodes where I describe something about how children develop musically and explain something. Like I would love to have Caitlin and Jenny as guests to talk about their study and then to yeah. talk about based on um, what we found, here's what we could recommend, just you know, something very yeah. accessible and straightforward. Uh, I think podcasts are a really exciting way to reach families and to broaden access. That's another thing that's really important to me because not everyone can bring their child to a caregiver child music class. Um, not everybody wants to. So how can we bring these ideas um, to people in new ways? I think that's really an exciting thing to think about. And it's exciting to think about building, you know, from everyday music, everyday singing uh, that everyone does, and the, the whole idea of the musical parenting and musical home, and the music of each culture, each family's um, community, um, you know, the music of the voice itself, you know, a lot of people don't even understand what prosody is, you know, the fact that we're singing to each other all the time, <laughs> and, and emotional meaning is through that, but in addition, that is 
part of musical entrainment separate from instrumental training. Often people think, well, they have to take music lessons every day, you know, or once a week, you know, that's music. But what you're expanding it into, which I love, is the everyday and the fact that it's innate in everyone and then part of our part of our, our home and part of learning and part of relation. And then that builds onto instruments and vocalization and all of that, where there's no longer this artificial d divide between the musician and the non-musician, or I sing or I don't sing, you know, which doesn't even exist in most cultures except for ours. Um, but anyway, um, Jenny and what? One more thing about that, Vicky, that I think um, our schools need to be more open and affirming and supportive exactly. of all music cultures. And I think yeah. that's something that is about to happen just as yeah. we are all committing again to anti-racism and to diversity, inclusion, equity, that if we can get that really from the beginning through preschool through early childhood through our K twelve schools at the university level yeah I think then families will start to see themselves as musicians when we're all valuing all of music yeah i think all of this has implications for education as well as parenting and then is our system going to look the same after covid probably not and so there's going to be more at home um and you know different ways of understanding arts and where they play a role for everyone. So um, Jenny and Caitlin, you guys want to talk about where you see your research going and the implications of it and just creatively imagine where you're going. Yeah, I think Jenny can kick us off here. Sure. Okay, Jenny. Yeah, I think um, Lisa, all of what you were saying is very consistent with what we have been thinking about as well. And so we recognize that our work is kind of one snapshot of families' experiences, one, one group of babies and families and the musical moments that happened in their lives. And um, we've done a lot of work to try to share the resources that we used to collect those data to make it easier for other researchers to do the same kind of work. Um, we are hoping people will use it and that they'll collaborate with us. Um, you can go to our website and listen to some of these clips to get a sense of what they're like and kind of see some of these resources. Um, but we're hoping that that will then allow us to collect many, many different snapshots from different settings, um, mm -hmm. like childcare, school settings, maybe hospital settings, um, and many different locations, cities and countries around the world, um, where we can really then start to um, study these everyday musical moments in these many different environments and kind of ultimately increase our understanding of what might lead to healthy musical diets. So the qualities of musical moments that might support children's healthy learning and development. Beautiful. Caitlin, you want to add to that? Yeah, I've just been noticing some themes across uh, all of our work that, you know, uh, one is sort of this lifelong learning idea. And as Vicki, you pointed out, starting even before a baby is born, because we know that some audio information uh, makes it through. Um, yeah, and so the, the lifelong learning and thinking through what are the, the variety of musical experiences that various folks have access to, you know, over the course of the lifespan. And, you know, we have situated this particular project pretty early on in the first year of postnatal life, and that may be setting a foundation for what's easier to learn, what's a little bit more challenging to learn next, and every experience is building and building and building. And so that, of course, is much bigger than any one researcher or one lab can do. So thinking through how to connect um, for this lifelong learning perspective across groups and across research projects seems really exciting to me. And I'm glad to have the Grammy Foundation support so that we can all have these conversations. Um, and the other thing that keeps coming up is music sort of embedded in everything human. Um, yeah. And in a cognitive development context, one of the things that I think I didn't fully appreciate until really delving into this project is there's language. So there's word learning with music. There's facial, emotional processing with music. There's rhythm, which is relevant for just about everything with music. There's objects, there's words, there's emotion, there's language, there's social, there's anything that anybody in human psychology would wanna study and wanna have a developmental account of 
you can't ignore music. And so it's exciting to me to think about music as sort of this ecology where all these skills are getting built together and to think about to how that may potentiate things in a really powerful way that I don't think has really surfaced in a lot of theorizing about early learning. I agree. Um, yeah, so just these things keep coming up about how it's infused, you know, in yeah. everything that we do as humans and, and sort of it never stops. It never yeah. stops. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's pretty it's exciting. Beautiful. You know, all of you, I think where this is heading, which is beautiful because it's exactly where I wanted to head here toward, as we're, we're moving here toward a, a not quite an ending yet, but I wanted to leave some time for this question, which is about collaboration. And it is also about access to, um, uh, like you were saying, Jenny, you know, you can go on my website and hear these sounds. Well, I didn't know that, you know, wouldn't that be cool for my students, you know, and for my work, um, but I didn't know that. Like, um, I think that one of the commitments of the Grammy Museum Foundation is, and this is a beginning of that, is to bring people together, but also provide you know, ways of accessing, you know, findings and then collaborating or sharing or building off of or the, the, um, the recorder that you mentioned. A lot of people may not know about that recorder. And, but how, how cool would it be to then have data coming from a lot of different places that you could use in one way and somebody else could use in a different way, you know, from a different lens, you know, and I don't know what that kind of sharing looks like, but we do have a group of people that are doing research that we have funded partially at least you know over over many years and 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 it and I think we all live in you know we have so much to do and we have the chaos of the world and we have our own research in our own lives um, we kind of end up getting siloed and um, we are I think moving systemically into an interdisciplinary and interconnected uh, world um, which and I'm wondering how you feel about uh, first of all, a lot of people don't know about the Grammy Foundation just even offering this, uh, about partnerships, about support. If you want to speak to that, um, how you feel about that, or um, how you view it for the future, and also what ideas you may have about how we could um, bring together, like here's Lisa's podcast, and here's Jenny and Caitlin's update on their global everyday experience, you know, in like Brazil and, you know, the, the songs of, of the Czech Republic. And, you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, how beautiful it would be. There's a, a CD I, I have called from lullabies all over the world. And one of the things about them is, is how, you know, different they all are, but how similar they all are, you know, um, rhythmically and melodic contours, you know, from a musical standpoint, they're very similar. Um, and, and, and sort of like sharing. So uh, does, uh, and, and I think that's kind of what you're all talking about. And I'm, I'm thinking this is a great opportunity to um, offer ideas uh, for other people that may not know about this, but also to think together and for the Grammy Foundation to also be able to think about. So, so I have to say one thing from our corner of the world, um, there is a little bit of an infrastructure and this is squarely within researcher land um, to share audio recordings. So however you may have recorded your audio, um, to have a repository that has, you know, appropriate safeguards for family privacy and things like that. But the idea is, it's called Home Bank, um, and I can send more information uh, if anybody's Great. interested later. Um, but the idea is exactly that, to aggregate across, well, we've managed to record this from this setting and this time and place, um, but other folks have different, uh, different data sets. Um, right. And so, and then there are some annotations that go along with that. So sometimes it's marking uh, transcripts for what's being said, sometimes it's musical annotations and so on. So it's meant to aggregate that. But uh, one thing I would just like to, to raise is that to, to have it be more um, uh, family friendly or public facing instead of researcher, you know, right. nerdy McNerd facing. Um, one thing that I think would be so exciting and I've seen this happen with um, what Renee Fleming and Francis Collins have done with the Sound Health Initiative is to pair up uh, folks from more popular music culture that a much broader range of people would have immediate connections to with us. So maybe that's something we saw on your podcast to pair, you know, somebody very famous, somebody, I don't know, some 
uh, kids show, kids singer that everybody will immediately get very excited about. I'm thinking Baby Shark and some other things, you know, um, to pair up with somebody who has a different perspective on a related theme and sort of a series like that, that would be super engaging. And that's also that's something totally within the Grammy purview. <laughs> yeah, <Obviously>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. how exciting would it be to have the major, major uh, musical figures in our culture connecting yeah. with researchers. I think that would be so engaging. I think that would be amazing. I it would be a way to kickstart sort of knowing yeah. about all of this stuff. I would be so excited to, to think through what that could look like. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. That could be its own podcast, really. If you took each Grammy um, grant winner from the last X number of years and then matched them with a musician to talk about together because yeah. I'm sure there would be so many ideas bubbling up and so many areas of resonance. That's a great idea, Caitlin. Other thoughts about sharing grants, partnerships? Um, Can we invite Imogen Heap and her cool gloves? And then we should get all the motor. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but you should Google image and heap and the Mimu glove. It's fantastic. I can think of so many interesting ways to use it in the Parkinson's yeah. research and the piano playing. I mean, minds would be blown. It would be so fascinating to me. Great. Any other thoughts about any of this? Jennifer, Elizabeth, Jenny? I think also having opportunities for um, participants if they would like to um, share their experiences. I know that I had one Parkinson patient who really enjoyed piano playing so much she would go on recruitment trips with me and talk to other friends about it because she was so passionate about, hey, this is an opportunity. I've always wanted to learn how to play the piano. I've never had that opportunity. And I thought because I had tremors, I couldn't do it. But it was interesting is when I started playing the piano, my tremors went away. So, um, it, you know, things like this, you know, when you hear it from someone who's had that experience and, you know, and, and to be able to, um, to see what, you know, the, to kind of put a, instead of just giving you the, the information about what's happened in our grants in, in forms of numbers or publications and dissemination right. that way, to kind of put a face on, 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 on the, the people that are actually receiving the benefits from, from these projects. Yeah, yes. Uh, and I was just going to say, me personally, my connection actually spread because of this grant. Um, once, you know, the, uh, you know, data got out there and some of the presentations, I had a lot of folks contacting me because they do singing in different areas of the country and of the world. And um, that was just, to me, that's just been one of the most amazing things. We just recently finished our uh, a virtual singing choir project where we had 170 members of the Parkinson's community from around the U.S. all record and sing together and I was just like this is amazing so um, you know for me this has actually expanded and you know I am so grateful and excited to share and you know move forward with uh, research and uh, whether it be in Parkinson's disease or in other realms, um, I think there's a lots of potential. Um, so while we can share among each other and whatnot, but I think it's also an important to note that it does expand uh, beyond, you know, just being involved with the yeah. Grammy Foundation. Yeah, and that speaks so much, Elizabeth, to what you were saying about social isolation, especially right now. Um, when we can all sing together and also the idea of I'm not alone with my illness or I don't have anything to be ashamed of, you know, we're all together and we all can do this and, and sort of that, you know, the healing of a group community and that experience, um, you know, of, of, of vocalizing together and rhythmically, you know, creating something together, the power of that, which we've known again forever, <laughs> a lot of, a lot yeah. of research, you know, I find uh, in neuroscience is um, especially is is validating what intuitive ancient wisdom has been telling us <laughs> for a lot of forever, um, but also giving us uh, new information. So, you know, it, it is an important blend. Um, but I love that idea of the virtual choir. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's a wonderful outcome. Yeah, and I I think um, like what Caitlin was saying about having uh, professional musicians engage, 
I think that's awesome. So I always um, have professional musicians help um, on different things. And it just raises the confidence of the, you know, even if they, you know, they like, I can't sing. I'm like, I don't really care. But it raises their confidence and their ability to perform. And then there's this like, well, I sang with so-and-so, you know, I always, you know, tease with them. I'm going to, you know, get them at Carnegie Hall or wherever, you know, we're going to perform. Um, it just, it's that in itself is a wonderful way even to get information out. And not only about the Grammy Foundation and, and whatnot, but um, also for the participants. And they feel that they have that uh, empowerment and ability to right. share about what they've experienced. I hear you. Going along with what Elizabeth said, I think um, receiving the Grammy Foundation grant um, and the participants knowing about that, it was it was really important to them to know I'm part of this project that has been recognized by wow. the Grammy Museum Foundation. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, part of the funds went to provide participant incentives. So um, I was able to purchase keyboards for several of the families who didn't otherwise have an instrument in the home. Um, one family chose tickets to some professional musical and dance productions in Cleveland, mm. some really nice speakers um, for the home for their listening. And so I think they knew they were some, part of something bigger and that was an important thing to them. Mm. That's really nice, Lisa. Thank you for adding that. Yeah. Other, Jenny, you want to say anything? Um, I, this is making me think of lots of ideas. So I'm trying to- Good, sure. <laughs> we have a little time. Um, I think I was thinking a lot about the social, social isolation piece, um, and especially for families with young babies in particular, that's a time of social isolation where that can be really challenging anyway. And then in our current context, that's like a double challenge. And so um, I love the idea of finding ways through podcasts or interviews with famous musicians um, to bring some of the ideas of what we know is helpful for families um, to them in a virtual environment. Um, and I think also what Jennifer was saying about um, having participants be able to share to, I could imagine that being very helpful for families as well, that having opportunities to talk about like, ooh, we sang Baby Shark for months on end. Um, and then we had to switch to another song. Um, it's kind of the range of, of knowing that, you know, various things work at various different times and, and maybe what works for one family is going to help another family or it will down the road. Mm -hmm. um, just having that sharing and that sense of community among, among families and parents and caregivers um, and different ways that they can use music um, that I think Lisa is highlighting in their, in their parenting and to support the things that are challenging and a, sort of extra challenging now that everybody is at home and trying to navigate all of the new And certainly from the, from the standpoint of risk resilience um, on the, those trajectories, um, this is what we would call a low to zero cost intervention for resilience um, that goes through the lifespan. And we know that in utero to three, you know, to five is, 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 is crucial. Of course, this can, you know, as Jennifer's talking about, and we, we don't have anyone here, but we have a lot of grants that we give from the Grammys um, for Alzheimer's and dementia uh, with music, obviously. Um, and infancy, I mean, meaning prenatal. <laughs> um, uh, some really interesting studies all the way through the lifespan. Um, but, but certainly from a developmental standpoint, you know, this doesn't, it costs virtually nothing. Um, or, you know, I mean, you can make musical instruments out of household items, you know, <laughs> uh, but it's your voice, it's your being, it's your, it's your song. Um, the, the, you know, from, from, the, from the person who loves the other. Um, and so, you know, what a gift to empower those who feel like they, they don't know what they're doing or they, you know, they, they, it is innately there, they just don't know it, you know, and teachers as well. And this brings me to um, a final question in terms of um, the big picture right now. Um, as researchers, as music researchers, and we talked big picture, uh, Elizabeth, you were, you know, and Caitlin, you know, it's, it touches every aspect of human life, music does. Um, uh, when you think about what's going on right now, and especially with um, may, a lot of performing arts shut down, um, and arts education being cut, 
in almost every educational program because it can't be done, you know, it's not done well or they can't do it virtually or they think they can't or it's not as, uh, they don't have the budget for it or whatever. Um, arts and sports seem to be the ones cut, but parents, you know, and we're, we're look, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what you're thinking about the importance of music right now, uh, given what's going on in the world right now. Um, and your view of, of just from a researcher standpoint and a lover of music and from your area, just what you want to say in closing about, about what you feel the importance of music is for, for all of us right now. So Lisa, you want to start? Yeah, so this summer I had the chance to bring together a group of individuals from the National Association for Music Education, NAFNI. We have an early childhood music special research interest group, so that's ECM SHRIG, and then the Early Childhood Music and Movement Association, ECMMA, and the editorial board of the International Journal for Music and Early Childhood. So these three groups of people, we came together for a Zoom call and my first goal was just to get us together to, because our national organization had been putting out guidelines for the fall, what to do with choir orchestra bands, but we weren't hearing anything about early childhood. So this group, um, and it was an international group came together in July. We formed three subgroups. And as a result, just last week, NAFMI published guidelines. There's a position statement about the importance of music in early childhood, birth to age eight, uh, reaffirming why it's important and why it's important now in helping teachers to advocate for their programs. And then there's a guidelines document that goes through safety recommendations, considerations, thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially during this time and what factors could be at play. And then we have this big, huge spreadsheet with the different teaching. Um, if you're in person, if you're on a cart, if you're hybrid, if you're uh, only online, things to consider, ideas, and then we're going to update that monthly um, to try to help teachers to keep this going. Well, this, can, Cleveland, this is in Ohio or na international or national? Wait. Sorry. It's an iner international group of uh, scholars oh. and practitioners that met over the summer to develop, um, and it was just published it's housed on NAFME and it's um, a joint copyright between NAFME and the ECMMA. I, and I, can, I can send you links, but um, we're really excited about the, the energy of these people from different organizations coming together with this heart to help teachers keep going. Great. Thank you. Other thoughts in sort of closing in big picture terms? Caitlin? So I'm going to step outside of my researcher lane here, actually. So before I was a researcher, I trained as a pre-professional ballerina. And so, you know, my, my instrument is my body and rhythm is something that I sort of feel in my bones and rhythm is everywhere. So we can use rhythm uh, throughout our daily experiences, um, you know, as we're encountering all of these stresses right now. Um, and just sort of the pervasiveness of you don't even need an instrument. You don't even need to sing. You just need to move your body. And that's musical. And so sort of just the encouraging a mindset with everybody we might be talking to that, you know, it's everywhere. And you can think about these as sources of resilience and sort of maybe atypical ways if you haven't already internalized rhythm is music. Yeah. Um, and, and so we can have small conversations. So what I'm hearing from Lisa is incredible and way outside of my scope of expertise in terms of education and, and teaching. But we're all chatting one-on-one -on -one with somebody. We have a call with somebody who's stressed. We have kids in our lives who may benefit from something. And you know, we can just sort of dance it out or sing it out or point out that we all have all of these sources of resilience, even if you maybe you hadn't thought about it that day. Um, that hopefully can carry forward in smaller ways. And it's so beautiful. I love these larger themes because it does cross over into everyone's work, whether it's Parkinson's or we're dealing with stroke rehabilitation or we're dealing with trauma, you know, if we're dealing with early childhood or uh, Alzheimer's and, you know, different forms of, of dementia and cognitive decline, prevention or it, at any stage. Um, you know, this idea of rhythmic attunement and uh, connection is key, you know, for humanity, right? <laughs> um, and so it, it is so important. Any, anybody else want to say anything 
in closing, we have just a couple minutes left. I would just say for us, um, especially in populations where isolation um, is detrimental to their health, um, like people with Parkinson's disease, um, the, the, the ability to still keep singing and making music is a motivating factor to keep them going. So even this big virtual project that we had where we had so many people together, the main thing I would hear is that it was just so nice to have something to work towards, a goal to work towards, you know, singing together and, um, and being able to share their voice. Um, and, you know, we did what the world needs now is love. And so they had that the ability to express their opinion in the time um, like that's going on right now, um, yeah. even from home. And I think that it, it's small things like what Caitlin was saying as long along with the big connections, you know, taking those small interactions, but also still making those big right. connections. That's really going to uh, bring home the point that you can't get away from music. It's in us. You can defund us and you can, you know, <laughs> take away grant funding. You can right. take away music education, but you're not right. going to stop the music. That's it's gonna right. be <laughs> so you might as well embrace it. That's right. Elizabeth. Yeah, and I've been thinking about collective collective trauma in terms of helplessness and hopelessness and not having a voice, um, not being seen and heard, which is my area of work with youth, foster youth and, and traumatized, abused children who've been abused is my area of clinical work as a, I'm a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. That's what I do. And I do work with music in my therapeutic practice. But the whole idea of, um, of democracy, <laughs> if you will, uh, and of a society where you have a voice and you're part of something larger than yourself and you contribute to something where you're with others and together we're creating something where we are both diverse and together simultaneously and we're unique and yet we are one. Um, those kinds of experiences are uniquely the province of the arts. And um, what better than music uh, for, for, for that and, and movement along with that rhythmically, right? Um, but I, I, I really appreciate all of you and your passion and your dedication and the, the really technical expertise that you bring scientifically to your work. Um, and I really want to thank you for being here today and offering your voice and sharing with each other and offering the Grammy Museum Foundation um, your thoughts and ideas and sharing your work with us today. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>